10 supplements for high blood sugar with humongous amounts of data behind them. Not some willy-nilly, woo-woo, witch doctor, weird stuff. Concrete, evidence-based stuff. Let's roll. First one, one you've heard of before, berberine. Check this out about berberine though. There was a study published in Ethnopharmacology that took a look at 27 randomized control trials with over 2,500 people, okay? What they found is that berberine decreased fasting glucose, postprandial glucose, and HbA1c, but it did so even better than the lifestyle intervention group. So they had some subjects just completely change their lifestyle altogether, and they had some subjects just add berberine in. The berberine was more impactful than the actual lifestyle intervention. This could be taken the wrong way, like, hey, don't change your life, just pop some berberine. But the reality is it just demonstrates how strong it is. What's interesting though, is that berberine does not seem to have as much of an impact on people that are really healthy, that don't deal with some insulin resistance. So it's good for those that are a little bit more severe of cases with high HbA1c or high blood sugar. Interestingly enough, it seems to increase insulin sensitivity and also seems to influence something called IGF, okay, insulin-like growth factor. Now, that is a little bit more of a complicated discussion, but IGF can influence how insulin is sort of sequestered and properly used within the body. That could be berberine's mechanism, but we really just don't know. Number two, inexpensive apple cider vinegar capsules. We know there's a lot of data surrounding apple cider vinegar, vinegar in general, acetic acid, and how it influences blood sugar. But this is pretty interesting when we look at this data. The Journal of Advanced Nursing took a look at six different studies, so meta-analysis, and they found that once again, adding vinegar into the diet lowered glucose and lowered HbA1c. But trying to understand the mechanisms here, it seems that it may have something to do with acetoacetate and sort of this conversion process into ultimately, basically what's called the Krebs cycle and ultimately creating energy. So it seems to not disrupt, but almost emulate energy in a way and activating AMPK. Complicated gobbledygook, but basically makes your body think it's in a little bit more of a deficit, thereby reducing sugar and kind of balancing things differently. Uh, additionally, it slows down the breakdown of carbohydrates. That's what vinegar can do. Now the capsules are usually concentrated acetic acid. So you can usually take you know, a few hundred milligrams of acetic acid capsules or apple cider vinegar capsules and actually have a noticeable impact on blood sugar. Next up is cinnamon. And yes, you can get cinnamon in a capsule form. And believe it or not, there's good research behind cinnamon. So there's a study published in Nutrition Journal that took a look at eight clinical trials Okay, ranging from a half a gram of cinnamon all the way up to six grams of cinnamon, ranging from 40 days all the way to four months. Okay, and they found, once again, significant improvements in fasting glucose, postprandial glucose, and HbA1c. They even found that it was effective as a sole treatment. So not even in tandem with other things. So like you could just straight up like have cinnamon or take in some more cinnamon capsules, like that simple. The only evidence we have mechanistically is that it seems to increase GLUT4 expression. GLUT4 is what allows glucose to come into a cell. It translocates to the surface of a cell membrane and then sucks the glucose in. If we increase the expression of it, that means at a genetic level, we're creating more of it. Is it the solid answer we're looking for? Eh, not necessarily, but we do know that happens. So I don't know, cinnamon's cheap, it's easy, and it seems to work. This next one is the only one in this list that is a little bit more fringe. And I had to include it because of my own anecdotal experience with it. It's alpha lipoic acid. Now there was a study published in the Saudi Medical Journal that was quite interesting with this. They took a look at 300 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid versus placebo for two months. They found some really interesting things. Decrease in fasting glucose, decrease in postprandial glucose, decrease in insulin resistance, and a decrease in glutathione. That's the wild card here. Now, what you can speculate when there's a decrease in glutathione like this, alpha lipoic acid is a very, very potent antioxidant. Like I take it after really long runs or I take it after really hard workouts to sort of give my body a little bit of help. Now, with that, if you have a decrease in glutathione peroxase, that means that your body isn't needing glutathione as much because the alpha lipoic acid took some of the weight off of it. So with that, there's a caveat. You don't want to take it all the time because it's decreasing your body's endogenous antioxidants. The good side is it's potent as all heck. Because it affects oxidative stress in your body, 
that's how it's impacting glucose so much, especially in high blood sugar or insulin resistant individuals that might have a higher level of oxidative stress to begin with. Now, I still take it even as a non-diabetic because I notice an improvement. And where I first started noticing it was I was looking at my continuous glucose monitor and I would notice that a lot of times after a run, I would spike. And it was like a rebound, probably stress effect. But then when I would take alpha lipoic acid, that spike didn't occur, like not once. And I would take 300 to 600 milligrams and try different doses. And it just would not go, it just would not spike afterwards. I realized something was happening. And that's when I started doing some research, but most of the data was pretty small. But the Saudi journal had a pretty decent amount of uh, participants. So I thought, okay, this is worth mentioning. Anyhow, if you want to try using a CGM and kind of test different things out for yourself, I did put a link down below for the one I use. It's called Cygnos. Now it uses a Dexcom G4 CGM, continuous glucose monitor. And then Cygnos is this really cool algorithmic technology. It's this app that works with the continuous glucose monitor to find your sweet spot. It finds your range, gives you a healthy range for your blood sugar to stay in, but also gives you real time feedback. So like if I went out and I ate a piece of cake, my phone would send me an alarm from Cygnos saying that my continuous glucose monitor shows that I'm spiking and it would kind of give me a playbook on what to do. Hey, go for a walk. Hey, do some squats. It has a whole coaching system, also a community, it's got challenges. But the cool thing is like Cygnos is really, really cool technology to help you develop the healthy habits and your time in range. So it's a really cool way for regular people to get access to a continuous glucose monitor without having to go through all the crazy rigmarole. So very, very interesting. And that link down below will save you 15% off if you wanna try Cygnos. I highly recommend it. Again, 15% off using that link and that code down below underneath this video in the top line of the description. Okay, American College of Nutrition published a wicked cool paper on vitamin D. Okay, they had type two diabetics go on 4,500 IUs of vitamin D for two months. So what they found with these type two diabetics is when they added the vitamin D in, as serum levels of vitamin D increased in their blood, their glucose, came down. There was like this relationship where it was an inverse situation where as vitamin D went up, their glucose went down as well as their HbA1c. Now we're starting to uncover some research here and the mechanisms a little bit. It seems as though vitamin D helps stimulate insulin release. So it actually helps the pancreas produce and release more insulin. In addition to that, vitamin D has huge anti-inflammatory properties. So on one hand, you're having more potency with your insulin. On the other hand, you have less interference and in inflammation. And this is a big lifestyle piece. Like this is not just take a supplement and it's magic. Like vitamin D is obviously huge because we have vitamin D receptors all over our body in different areas. So it's just about, okay, is it this giant orchestra that's helping improve glucose modulation or is it singular? It's probably the whole thing. Like we just know one particular mechanism in the way of insulin. Okay, this next one is really wild. It's magnesium. And there was a study that took a look at type two diabetics with magnesium, put them on only 250 milligrams of magnesium, by the way, 250 milligrams or placebo, okay? And they found, again, decrease in fasting glucose, decrease in HbA1c, but also a decrease in insulin. This is really important because it tells us something that we really need to know about the specific mechanism with magnesium. Magnesium is critical for the proper function of an insulin receptor. You can produce all the insulin in the world, but if your insulin receptors aren't working, you're gonna keep producing insulin to try to finally get it there. But if you increase the ability for the receptor to receive a signal, then you don't need as much insulin. So that is a good reason why insulin levels went down. And that was with 250 milligrams, which is not that much. Most people recommend 400 to 500 milligrams. With magnesium, I recommend a dimagnesium malate or a magnesium glycinate. This next one is probiotics, which is really interesting too, because there's a study published in Medicina, took a look at seven different studies. So again, larger scale data and found that when probiotics were used, there were huge improvements in glucose, fasting glucose, postprandial glucose, and HbA1c. However, they only seemed to become significant if probiotics were used for eight weeks or longer. That adds up with a lot of other literature. For a full gut microbiome change, like you really need four to eight weeks for things to start remodeling. You can change your gut in 20 minutes by eating fiber. Like that can make a huge impact. You can change it overnight. 
but you're not gonna completely remodel your microbiome and increase diversity unless you're doing it for a while. So adding probiotics in, especially if you're not changing your diet, that's gonna take some time for that to kind of proliferate and do anything. But the reason that it seems to have this effect is probably because the decrease in what's called lipid peroxidation. So you have less oxidative stress because you have more anti-inflammatory, antioxidant capabilities as a result of a healthy microbiome, which indirectly affects blood sugar. Granted, there were a lot of other things that were looked at in this Medicina meta-analysis, but blood glucose was just a big piece of it. This next one is really wild because it did not work that well for type two diabetics, but it worked really well for healthy people. There were 17 studies in this meta-analysis that were published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition looking at green tea. They found that green tea significantly reduced HbA1c, and that was just with straight up drinking green tea. Then there's other literature to back up green tea extract. So what we're kind of elucidating out of this is that it's the green tea extract, the polyphenols and the EGCG, the catechins in the green tea that seem to have an impact. Why don't they work on regular diabetics? I mean, it kind of worked, it just didn't work that much. We don't really know, but green tea extract or straight up EGCG is something you can get in inexpensive, very dirt cheap supplement form. I've literally seen it at the dollar store and it seems to be hugely impactful. So if you're concerned about your glucose and you're trying to keep it in check, before a problem arises, it's a great one to try. The next one is chromium picolinate at about 400 micrograms. And there was a study published in the journal Metabolism that had subjects consume 400 micrograms of chromium versus placebo. They found that there was quite a decrease in glucose and HbA1c. However, it seemed to only be significant in men. And that we just don't have an answer for. We don't really understand why it would work better in men versus women. And we've actually seen some of this data in other studies but it hasn't been as strong as it was in this metabolism study. So why that's the case, don't know. Now, chromium is required for an insulin uh, receptor as well, so it could have something to do with that, but it doesn't explain the whole men versus women thing here. And the last one we need to talk about is one gram of ginseng with a meal. There's a study published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition demonstrated that eight weeks of doing this, eight weeks of having one gram of ginseng with a meal, decreased glucose, decreased postprandial glucose, and HbA1c. But then there was other data that suggests that there was a 33% increase in insulin secretion in type two diabetes. This is the more powerful thing here, because even though that's smaller data, it gives us the reason why this larger data occurred. If you have better insulin secretion, again, you want a lot of insulin at the right time. Or I shouldn't say a lot, but enough insulin at the right time. Inadequate amounts of insulin will not get the glucose down too much insulin, you're gonna have hyperinsulinemia, which is another hormonal problem. So potent, concentrated amounts of insulin at the right time. So perhaps ginseng is helping all that align a little bit better. We don't really know because it's still pretty new. Anyhow, 10 supplements, that'll be good for high blood sugar. I'll see you tomorrow.